I, I, I want to I, I wanna start with something I noticed in page 130 of your book. Start here, start now. Uh, Dr. Angela Chan Taro. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her, her last name right. Okay. Dr. Dr. La Angela Chan Taro of, of UCLA, of the Teacher Education Program Express. A bar in mathematics is important because it means recognizing that there's an inequitable system currently in existence, and we need to strive to be educators who are seeking to transform or disrupt that system. In addition to start here, start now, which obviously I'm highly endorsing. <laughs> what are three resources you recommend for new math teachers? And why these resources? Thank you for that question. Oh my gosh. Okay, so there's so many books and I did pull a couple. Um, one that I do quote in uh, my book is from Rethinking Schools. I have Rethinking Mathematics. Um, this is all about teaching like social justice topics through the lens of math. Um, it is mainly like middle school and high school, but I did find a lot of the examples that are given in here, because it's written as an anthology, a lot of different teachers um, gave different like case studies and examples of their own practice and thinking about what are kind of like the pieces that are still applicable to elementary school since most of my experience is teaching like K through six. Um, so I really like this one. Um, Another book that I only got maybe like a year ago, um, and this one is for high school, is High School Mathematics Lessons to Explore, Understand, and Respond to Social Injustice. Um, it's kind of similar to the Rethinking Math book, but it's just, it's more. And so I really love and appreciate that. I think it's really great to be able to hear from a lot of different teachers and perspectives since there are so many different types of schools working with so many different you know, students of different demographics and identities. Um, and then the last book is not specifically a, um, a math text, um, but my friend Alex Sharon Vinette's book, Equity Centered Trauma Informed Education, I think is just a really important book for any educator. Um, and realizing that I had had so many negative experiences with math that I actually began to demonstrate some sort of trauma, like shutdown responses, like when I was in middle school and in high school in a math class. Um, just noticing, you know, just how your students show up, thinking about their prior experiences, what they might be going through. And I think it's just a really good book to help set up any teacher for building relationships with students and examining their own practice. So highly recommend as well. That, and I, I read that section in your book. Well, I bounced around in a lot of sections, but you talked about that math trauma you had. And and I I had a similar experience when I was on uh, Brother Kwame's platform, Kwame Sofa Mensa. I, I talked about the fact that I, you know, mm -hmm. never saw myself a, as a math person. So thank you for identifying that in your book. We, we won't go fully there, but I could definitely relate. And I've been trying to challenge myself to to rethink the way I see myself as it relates to to math uh, you know I wish I had these resources I wish my teachers had these resources I, I wish folks were teaching in a way that truly uh, drew me in when I was in K through 12 and uh, uninterested in math because of the way it was being taught and because I, I did not see myself as a math person and, and there's a paragraph on page 131 that that also drew me in and I highlighted three sentences within that paragraph that I want to read okay. and then have you react to and, and you can share what you were thinking when you wrote those lines you can speak about how it resonates with you in this particular moment or, or you could just make a connection that perhaps you did not okay. articulate in the book so here are the three sentences Bob Moses civil rights activist and author of radical equations describes mathematics as a tool of liberation. I'll stop there before I go on to the other two Oof. sentences. That still resonates with me. I actually have this book too. This is his book. I highly recommend it too. Um, Bob Moses is such an incredible, or was such an incredible human. He is definitely somebody who I wish I had known about as a student. I think learning about his legacy his passion, how he applied mathematics to all of the civil rights work and like the intersection of activism and math and 
I think it would have just made it far more relevant and meaningful to me because those were already things that I was interested in as a student. Um, I just never really saw math as connecting to anything I really cared about um, as a kid. Um, I very much believe this. And another text that I've read recently that's really cemented my belief that math is a tool of liberation is Heather McGee's book, The Sum of, um, Sum of Us. I really loved her perspective as an economist and looking at how racism and white supremacy ends up impacting everybody on this quantitative level also, um, which is something that I hadn't really explored before. So definitely still very much believe this. And I do think that for some people who might not be as on board or as fluent or maybe a little bit more, you know, apprehensive about all of the social justice work that's going on, sometimes presenting folks like that with number sets, with data sets, um, sometimes make it a little bit harder to refute that these things like the, these systemic inequalities are everywhere and that are impacting people of different identities really differently. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Awesome. The next statement. In today's world, economic access and full citizenship depend crucially on math and science mm -hmm. literacy. Most very state. much still agree with that too. <laughs> just very much in agreement um i think about uh, i'm sure that for many educators out there especially if you've worked in actually any type of school doesn't matter if it's private charter public um have probably been in some sort of meeting about testing data especially math testing data and especially in how black yeah. students especially black boys perform in math classes um and thinking about how so many schools out there look at those that those data sets and think well there must be something wrong with the population and must be something on the students not how are we examining our curriculum our pedagogy the way we think about people and kids of different identities approaching with certain subjects um, i think being able to develop this literacy in a way that is meaningful that is relevant can be such a game changer when we see the types of disparities that folks of color folks of the global majority are up against um, in our society i think i rambled i hope that makes sense <laughs> No, no, no. There's, there's so much to unpack there, especially when we're talking about testing and how it's impacting different demographics. So appreciate your insight there. Last statement. Financial literacy is also a key component in a social mm. justice math curriculum. Interestingly, this one, I know I wrote this, and I'm not sure it actually, like that statement resonates with me as much as it did when I wrote it. I think there's just a lot of nuance that isn't super clear in that particular sentence. I do think it is financial literacy is a really important component like of math of just of education period. It shouldn't have to just be math. Um, that there are things that schools can do to equip their students to go out into the world to be able to navigate all of you know the things that they're going to experience. Um, and I still think, I mean, it reminds me kind of the modular quote about like the master's tools are never going to, you know, break down like the master's house. Um, and especially in the society that we live in that is driven by capitalism, mm -hmm. that understanding how mm -hmm. to navigate and survive within that system, yes, is important. And we also have to start thinking about alternatives. Like, what are we going to do to dream of a different system that is not going to, you know, put some people at, like, the, the bottom of, like, the social hierarchy based on how much money that they have? So I think I would just want to dive into that statement a little bit more. I appreciate your honesty there. You know, I think sometimes it might be hard for an author to recognize that and say, you know what, I wrote this at this time, but I think differently. And what you're saying around financial literacy connects to something that I heard from Sergio C. Munoz, somebody I, I recently interviewed, and he, he had a, a similar perspective. He elaborated on that, but th there's some alignment there. We'll move on. On page 135, you state, becoming an ABAR-focused STEM teacher does not mean we abandon teaching concepts like subtraction, and the water cycle. It simply means that we shift the lens through which we teach 
our content. Can you elaborate on this statement, particularly what it means and looks like to shift the lens through which yeah. we teach you know, I, our I think content? That, like, when I do a lot of professional development with educators of like lots of different backgrounds and different schools, um, a really common concern or like perceived barrier that comes up is I don't have enough time. Like I already have these standards. I have this curriculum. Right. How am I going to have time to like do social justice work on top of all the things that I have to do? And so the idea of shifting your lens is recognizing that this is not this like add on to your curriculum. It's not like a separate class. It's not a separate part of your day. Um, it's really shifting the perspective and lens through which you're teaching. So for example, um, if one of my standards is like multi-digit multiplication, yes, like my students need to know how to multiply large numbers, 100%. And if I want to make this more relevant and applicable to them and keep this lens, I'm gonna teach them how to do that by engaging with some real world problems. That um, like, for example, in the book, I talk about a unit that I did when I was teaching fourth grade, where we looked at the cost of living in Los Angeles, we looked at the average minimum wage compared to like the average rent in different parts of the city and how much entry level jobs were paying. Um, so still hitting those standards, but using, you know, this different perspective, like the shift in the content and the like the number sets that we're bringing in to make it more relevant and meaningful to students. And that was, from what I recall reading, something that was eye-opening to the students. I, I think it was written there that students reacted in a way where, like, wow, we didn't know it cost this much to, to live in Los Angeles. And yeah. kind of questioning, like, hey, Absolutely. how do people Absolutely. There were a lot themselves? of kids who were like, oh, because we I remember dividing that up into, you know, the wants versus needs. Like, the things that we need. We need shelter, um, transportation, uh, food, and then the things that they want, like, if the kid decided I want like an annual pass to Disneyland, that's really expensive. Like, how is that going to fit into your budget? Like you want to buy yourself like a PlayStation five. How is that going to fit into your budget also? Um, and hearing, <laughs> hearing like nine year olds come up to me and be like, Ms. Liz, like, I don't think I can afford all of this. And it's like, well, welcome to being an adult. Yep. <laughs> it's super great. <laughs> it's a wonderful lesson. It's real life. That they're, they're having this practical application, and that is going to stick with them much more than some of the stuff that you know we've been doing. Um, so let's let's continue to push folks to to shift their lens, shift their approach. On one forty two of your book, you you quoted Chris Widmeyer. I don't know if I said his last name right. Correct me if I didn't. <laughs> Looks like I did. Um, it, <laughs> He stated, students need to be able to look at issues that might be using science to fuel discrimination in order to recognize and combat them and use science as a tool of empowerment to make the world better. Can you offer a couple current examples of issues that might be using science yeah, to fuel discrimination? Yeah, I think a lot about the battles right now over including and teaching about LGBTQIA plus identities issues, history, um, that some people might try to take the like purely scientific approach and say, nope, that when it comes to gender, even though gender is not the same thing as sex, that there is a biological basis for this. We can look at chromosomes, like you are what you are when you're born, and like, that's it. Um, so I certainly see some STEM being weaponized there to silence the queer community, especially the trans and non-binary community. And we have you know, I'm supposed to be talking about current issues. And we, we have seen like so much of this in history as well, down to, you know, science is perpetuating falsely the belief that black people, for example, don't feel pain the way that white people do, which leads to black people, especially black women, not being taken seriously when they go to the doctor. We still see the legacy of that today. So there's a lot of really unfortunate examples. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Reminds me of... Some, an article I read when Serena Williams was given birth and some of the difficulty that she experienced with the service that she received in the hospital she was at. Yeah. And, you know, I think she almost died. Uh, terrible. And, they, you know, she was letting them know, like, hey, something's wrong. And, you know, I need this. I need that. And they just weren't listening to her until she really got in their face about it. Terrible. Um, <clears throat> all right. So if... 
you had an opportunity to have lunch with any scientist or mathematician, dead or alive. Okay. Who, who would it be? I thought about why? this really hard because there's a lot. Um, I think if I could pick any scientist, um, I would want to meet Bessie Moses. And if you're not familiar with her, she was um, a Jewish woman um, who was right at like the cutting edge around birth control um, and gynecology. She uh, is one of the people that we can credit for having Planned Parenthood today. Um, and even though she was operating in like the 1920s in Baltimore, um, one of the first birth control clinics, I think in Baltimore, she was really dedicated to training nurses of all different identities. She trained white doctors, black doctors in gynecology and contraception, um, frequently worked with women's colleges to try to empower women as much as possible. Um, she's a really amazing, powerful figure. Um, and not a lot of people know about her. So I'd want to, I want to meet up with her. Thanks for sharing. I'm not familiar with Betsy Moses, but I have to do some research. So what's the message of encouragement you want to share with I think the for audience? folks who are trying to engage with, you know, STEM subjects and anti-bias and anti-racism, they can feel very much like this isn't your field or your lane, which is something I hear a lot in professional development. A lot of teachers will say, like, this is just for humanities. That's, you know, what we're reading and what we're writing about. But, you know, numbers are just objective. So, like, why does this fit in? There is, like, rarely anything such as objectivity when it comes to education, especially public education. Um, so just knowing that, yes, there is very much a place and a need for this perspective um, and this pedagogy in the subject that you're teaching, um, and that maybe revamping your entire curriculum feels like a really big lift and it feels really impossible, and you can still start somewhere. I know like that sounds really cheesy, but picking one standard or one unit, um, you know, that's up and coming and just, you know, trying something a little bit different with your students um, and see if they just, you know, respond differently. And I have a feeling they probably will. So don't give up. You can start small, try to build capacity and community with the other teachers at your school to see if they'd be willing to maybe come in with you to do this together. So it doesn't feel like you have to do this alone. I don't, I don't think it's cheesy at all because I think sometimes people rush and they try to do too much and they get overwhelmed. So I think that's solid advice for folks to chip away at things, you know, try one thing, perfect that, try something else, gradually build up. Uh, I think that's solid. Liz, I appreciate your time. We are able to dig in in this short window of time and really make it happen. Uh, again, love what you're doing. Love, love the book. Start here, start now. Folks, if you don't have it, be sure to support Liz's work. Get yourself a copy of this book. Encourage the school to get some copies for the teachers. It's a guide to anti-bias, anti-racist work in your school community. It breaks down ways that you could approach the parent community, which I think you know all of us probably need to, you know, either strengthen that, or or maybe you're starting out and you have some reservations of of how to loop parents into the work that we're doing, especially with all the craziness that's happening. It also provides advice on on getting student buy-in and how to empower them to, to help co-lead in this work. Uh, and then certainly for folks, I mean, we, we can talk a, a lot about the different sections of the book, but, you know, obviously I wanted this interview to focus on STEM. Uh, I, I wanted this to focus on science and math because I also hear a lot of what Liz was sharing in terms of some of the pushback, some of the resistance, some of the reservations that, that folks have in terms of doing anti-bias, anti-racist work in the science and math classrooms. It is possible. You're not going to be the first. You're not going to be the last. There are resources, and we, we need to challenge ourselves to wrestle through the discomfort of trying on something new and exploring something new. Uh, it's new to us because, you know, the, the system really doesn't want it to be exposed. Uh, but folks have been doing this work. Uh, so thank you, Liz. Keep pressing on. Thank and, uh, Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate the with opportunity to chat with you today. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> Bye. Indeed. Take care.